The Adventures of Batman and Robin on the Super Nintendo has always been one of my personal favorite superhero games. Not only is it simply a joy to play, but as an adaptation of the highly acclaimed Batman animated series many of us watched and enjoyed from the 1990s, there are none better. The character sprites, animations, level design, all of these elements come together to beautifully and faithfully recreate the look and feel of the show that inspired it. But The Adventures of Batman and Robin on SNES was not the only version of this game that had been made and released during the mid-90s. There were also console versions on the Sega Genesis, as well as its more powerful CD-ROM attachment, the Sega CD. Typically, licensed games like this on both the Super Nintendo and Genesis were, for all intents and purposes, fairly identical to one another regarding their overall designs and gameplay. The differences only really lied in the graphical styles and music capabilities of the hardware, which in most cases was pretty superficial. When talking about the three versions of the adventures of Batman and Robin, however, this was not the case, as all three games looked and played quite different than the others. I've already discussed the SNES port in a separate video before, so check that out if you haven't done so already. But I wanted to take the next few weeks to review the two versions of the game published by Sega starting with The Adventures of Batman and Robin on Genesis. Though it does utilize some platforming and beat-em-up elements like the Nintendo release, the Sega version is primarily a side-scrolling shooter that has you firing an infinite number of batarangs at all of the enemies that pop up on screen. You can hold down the attack button to continuously fire your batarangs, or wait until the meter beside your health and under your score fills up, at which point, you can fire a more powerful variation of your Batarang to do increased damage. Though honestly, I never really noticed much of a difference between the two. I never found using the stronger Batarangs very useful, because in the time it would take you to connect with several of the strong Batarangs, with a higher chance of missing their target, you could have just spammed the weaker ones and hit a lot more. I think both strategies have the same level of risk and reward to them, and equate to the same amount of damage in the end. Unless, of course, you are in Adventures of Batman and Robin on Sega Genesis Prodigy, and therefore never miss or get hit. In that case, the stronger Batarangs are probably the better option, but for most of us playing, I don't think it really matters. Not only do you have the two different variations of the Batarang in your arsenal, but you can also collect power-ups in the form of three different colored bat symbols enemies will drop, orange, blue, and green. The orange pickup imbues your Batarangs with what I can only assume is fire, the blue one is electricity, and the green one may be a fur cloud or a scarecrow's fear gas, who really knows? One thing the Genesis version of this game has over the Super Nintendo one is the option to play as both Batman and Robin. I always found it weird that you couldn't play as Robin in the SNES version, despite the game being called The Adventures of Batman and Robin. The Boy Wonder does pop up a few times to aid Batman in some of the levels, but not being able to actually play as him felt like false advertising. The other cool thing about the Genesis version is that there was cooperative multiplayer, so you can play as the dynamic duo side by side, taking down the forces of evil in Gotham. I got to capture the footage for this review, playing the game with my twin brother, so that was awesome. But it was only awesome because we got to do something together. We didn't find the adventures of Batman and Robin on Sega Genesis to be all that fun or engaging. It's enjoyable for about 5 or 10 minutes, but after that, it becomes extremely repetitive and tiresome. It wouldn't be a problem if the levels in the game were shorter, but so many of them seem to just drag on and on and on. Some of the boss battles are agonizing and take forever to complete. 
Each of them is given 100 hit points, and it can sometimes take several batarangs to drop them down a single point, even when playing with two players. The Cheshire Cat in Wonderland, and especially the Mad Hatter, are two of my least favorite boss encounters in the game. They seem to last an eternity, and with Jervis, his battle has him constantly hiding in his giant top hat, between these annoying jumping sequences, having you dodge playing cards. It's an endurance of the mind, and just becomes tedious and dull by the end. It's like you're falling down the rabbit hole into madness while playing it, being driven insane from boredom. And this is really heartbreaking, because visually the game looks incredible, dare I say, one of the best looking titles ever to be released on Genesis hardware. The levels are so colorful and vivid, there are so many neat things that catch your eye in the backgrounds. It's just that the gameplay is so excruciatingly repetitive that it saps the life right out of you after a few short hours. I now understand why Batman and Robin are standing on top of that tall skyscraper at the beginning, before the title screen appears. They want to jump off it, and their misery, before the player forces them through all of that torment again. Something I do really admire though about the adventures of Batman and Robin on Genesis are its impressive and epic cutscenes at the beginning and end of the game, as well as its overall story. It centers around the Joker, Two-Face, and Mad Hatter breaking out of Arkham Asylum with the help of Mr. Freeze, who acts as this game's primary antagonist. His plan is to freeze Gotham City using a giant freezing cannon, which was an element used in the comics in the 1980s, as well as the 1997 film Batman and Robin. Having Mr. Freeze be the central villain here is quite unique, not something done in many Batman games, and helps the adventures of Batman and Robin on the Sega Genesis stand out, despite the lack of excitement in its gameplay. I also love how the developers tried to adapt a few more of the villains from the animated series like Freeze and Mad Hatter that weren't featured in the SNES port, another aspect that helps it stand on its own from that game. One thing I do wish about the Genesis version though is that it had more cutscenes to tell its story. The first one showing the breakout at Arkham is creepy and sets the tone for the rest of the game. And the last one, which depicts Freeze in his prison cell, holding the snow globe with text over top, it's a nice way to close off the narrative. But all you get are those two. I think having more cutscenes in between each of the levels would have helped add extra layers to the game's story, ensured the player remained engaged with what they were doing, and most importantly, would have helped alleviate some of the game's repetitiveness by giving you a bit of a breather in between those long and grueling stages. A lot of people seem to remember the adventures of Batman and Robin on Sega Genesis fondly and enjoy it a great deal, but unfortunately I'm not one of them. It lacks the variety to its gameplay and the overall replayability that was found in the version of it on Super Nintendo. Its visuals are absolutely stunning, the soundtrack kicks ass, and the fact that it adapts Mr. Freeze as its main villain is commendable but nowhere near enough to save it. The game is unnecessarily long and unsatisfying to play. From a purely gameplay perspective, it's one of the worst Batman games out there in my opinion. Harsh, I know. I want to thank you all for watching my review of The Adventures of Batman and Robin on Sega Genesis. I hope I didn't piss off too many of you out there with this one, and you managed to find some level of enjoyment with this video. If you'd like to help support the production of content like this, make sure to subscribe to the channel, hit that bell icon for notifications, and become a producer over on Patreon.com if you can. I will see you all in the next one. Take care and stay nerdy.